Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Pacific launch of the Mercer CFA Institute Global Pension Index. For those who don't know me, I'm David Knox, a senior partner at Mercer. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of this morning and to welcome my fellow panel members, uh, Maria Wilton, who is the board vice chair of the CFA Institute, Professor Deep Kapura, the director of the Monash Centre for Financial Studies, uh, Debbie Blakey, the CEO of HESTA, and Martin Lewington, the CEO of Mercer in New Zealand. Uh, fantastic to have you on board, and we are hoping that Deb Ralston will join us shortly. But uh, to introduce and to welcome everybody, I'll pass over to Maria. You're on mute, Maria. Trap for new players. Um, thanks, David, and it's great um, to have such a, a, a wonderful group of people um, here on the panel, but also joining us. I was fortunate to, to see um, all of the registrants and recognised um, very many senior leaders um, from the industry, uh, as, as well as uh, many people that I have, uh, have worked with um, uh, in the deep, dark, distant past and also more recently. So welcome and um, look forward to um, this session today. But before we would begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So the CFA Institute is just delighted to become the major sponsor of the Global Pension Index. For those of you that are new to the CFA, um, we are not just that really hard exam, um, although we are that too, just ask uh, any charter holder. Um, but the mission of the CFA Institute is broader than that. It's to lead the investment management profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education and professional excellence for the ultimate benefit of society. We all know the importance of sustainable pension and retirement systems to the healthy functioning of society. And system effectiveness has particular significance for all of us in the investment management world. How good the system is, coupled with how well we do our jobs, directly impacts the well-being of billions of people globally. That's important stuff. And according to this year's Future of Finance Trust Survey, 50% of individual investors rate retirement income as their number one investment goal. So for the CFA Institute to be able to contribute to the important work done by David Knox is an honour and a privilege, and I think a marriage made in heaven. We now look forward to promoting great retirement incomes regulation and policy as informed by this important work. Our local CFA societies in over 160 markets give us global reach. The incredible expertise and passion of our society leaders and their desire to make a difference give us a great wealth of talent and the supporting infrastructure, networks and respect commanded by the CFA Institute give us terrific leverage to engage with policymakers to advocate for continued improvement in retirement systems across the world. So as you can see, I'm proud of the partnership between Mercer, CFA and Monash, and I'm excited about what we can achieve. With that, I'll pass back to David. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Maria, and uh, welcome, Deb. Deb's now with us, but we'll pass over to Deb um, at the end of this presentation for our panel discussion. As Maria suggested in her comments, around the world, people's trust in pension systems is lower than it should be. And the OECD a couple of years ago mentioned that population aging, low returns, low growth, less stable employment, all are contributing to eroding the belief that pension systems will deliver on their promises. That was two years ago. Now we're in 2020 and things have changed again because we've had COVID. And so we are 
we're really concerned that with COVID, as well as the quote from 2018, pension reform is now even more important than ever. So the Global Pension Index is now making really significant suggestions to improve pension systems around the world. But before we go to the, the suggestions, let's have a look at the framework we have used for the last 12 years in the Global Pension Index. This is the World Bank model, and there are five pillars. Pillar zero is the base pension. And for those of us in Australia and New Zealand, Australia, it's a means tested age pension. In New Zealand, it's the universal pension. Pillar one common in Europe is a public social security system where pensions are linked to earnings. So pillar zero and one is really in the public sector provided by government. Pillar two and three is the private sector where you might have a mandatory or almost mandatory system in Australia, the SG, in New Zealand, KiwiSaver. Pillar three is where it's voluntary, either for employers or individuals. So pillar two and three are in the private sector. And then pillar four is what happens outside the formal pension systems. It might be other savings, other investments, um, ownership of home and other components to give people financial security in retirement. The advantage of the Global Pension Index is it doesn't just look at one pillar, we look at the complete picture. It's important to note that we are comparing. We want to learn from each other. What are the good systems doing well? There's no absolute answer here. So let's learn from each other. In this sense, we use objective data from international agencies that makes up a little bit more than half the value of the index and details and uh, objective data about each system in each country from our Mercer colleagues and other representatives around the world. Now, some elements are really difficult to measure objectively. For instance, trust in the system, community confidence. And it'd be great to have something like that available, but some of that data is very difficult to measure in different cultures. Compare China, to Peru, to Europe, um, to Indonesia. Uh, you, we've tried to use objective measures across the whole index. And there are more than 50 indicators. Obviously, some are more than important than others. And the weightings are a little bit subjective, but we've tried to weight the more important measures. It's important to note that we look at the overall system. So we're not looking at what a particular individual might receive in retirement. And we're not looking at what the best pension system or the best occupational pension system might look like. It's the system as a whole. So let's have a look at what the fundamental questions are. The first one is adequacy. What does the system provide? What do you get out of the system? The next one is sustainability. Can the system keep delivering, not only next year, not only next 10 years, but 30, 40, 50 years hence. Adequacy and sustainability are really both important. And within the Australian context, the recent Retirement Income Review consultation paper mentioned both of these. You could have a system like Greece some years ago, which provided very good benefits, but clearly wasn't sustainable. But then we must be able to trust the system. And that's where governance and integrity come into play. Because if we don't trust the system, I would suggest the system is not sustainable over the long term. It will lose confidence of the community. So how do we put all that together? In looking at the Global Pension Index, we weight adequacy a little bit more and integrity a little bit less. And as I go through each of them, you'll see we dig deep into each uh, sub-index. So let's now start to have a look at what we've done this year. We're always looking to improve the index. There's new OECD data this year, uh, which has actually affected net replacement rates for several systems. 
We're looking at life expectancy this year. Traditionally, we've taken it from birth, but we've made an adjustment this year to take it from the retirement or pension age in that country because we're looking at the years in retirement. We're not looking how long you will live, but how long do you need retirement income support? The third change we've made this year is we've added a new question about the pension public expenditure on pensions. What is the government spending on pensions as a percentage of GDP? Traditionally, we've always looked at government debt. Of course, debt, government debt now is not as expensive as it used to be with very low interest rates, but public expenditure will affect government budgets around the world. We've also added a couple of uh, newer questions, broadening the index a little bit. One is, uh, what support is in the pension system for those who are taking time out to care for young families? Uh, that's, I think, an important question. And the other one is, what's the requirement or attitude towards ESG in your system? Again, a trend and an important trend around the world. The other change we've made this year is we've added two new countries and more of that a little bit later, but we've added Belgium and Israel. That brings us to 39 systems around the world in 38 countries. You might wonder, how does that work? China, of course, two systems, one country, one system for mainland China and one system for Hong Kong. We cover 39 systems representing almost two thirds of the world's population. Okay, so let's have a look at the scores. Inadequacy, we look at the minimum pension. What do you get if you don't have much when you retire? Net replacement rate. What do you get if you have a full career for 40 years or thereabouts, calculated by the OECD? We look at some of the desirable system features, particularly in the private pension space. The level of household savings, outside pensions, but also the level of household debt, because if a country has household debt, that will have to be repaid. And Australia has the second highest household debt as a proportion of GDP after Switzerland. The level of home ownership, if you own your own home, you'll have more security in retirement. And the level of growth assets, very difficult to measure real investment returns across a system. And this is a proxy for that. If you're only investing in bonds, you're not going to get much return, particularly in the current environment, and that must affect the adequacy of the benefits. The top three countries in terms of adequacy, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany. Down the bottom, three emerging systems of India, Thailand, and Mexico. Of course, this is the Pacific launch of the index, and I better let you know where Australia and New Zealand rate Australia has come in 14th inadequacy with a score of 66.8 and New Zealand is 18th with 63.8. Now let's have a look at the sustainability sub-index. And here we look at the coverage of funded pension plans. Are we putting money aside for the future? How much are we putting aside? The level of assets, demographic issues, life expectancy, things like the state pension age, it's more sustainable if we retire a bit later. What level of money are we putting aside for the future? Contributions. Labor force participation at older ages. If we work a bit longer, it's all more sustainable. As I mentioned earlier, public pension costs, government debt, influences on uh, the public budget, and real economic growth. If an economy is growing, then you're going to have more employment, more contributions, better investment returns. That makes it all sustainable. That particular indicator has gone backwards this year around the world, and that due to COVID, and that has reduced the sustainability sub-index score in virtually every system. The top three countries for sustainability, Denmark, Netherlands, and Australia. The bottom three are interesting, Brazil, Austria and Italy. Austria and Italy, two developed economies in Europe, but they've virtually put nothing aside for the future. They have aging populations and their sustainability in this space can be significantly questioned. 
Australia is third, New Zealand is ninth in sustainability with a score of 62.9. Now let's have a look at integrity. Integrity is all about trust and confidence and therefore things like regulation, governance, protection, how we communicate with members. What do we have to do? The very best pension systems do a bit more than what they have to do, but we're, we're looking here primarily at what the government requires of the private pension systems in terms of governance regulation, et cetera. Uh, costs are also important. It's virtually impossible to get costs of the system, of the whole system. So we have a couple of proxies in the integrity sub-index. Down the bottom, uh, three systems that are still emerging and developing in terms of regulation, Argentina, Mexico, and the Philippines. So let's put all that together. And let's have a look at the world. Well, you all been from the Pacific, you all jump to our area of the world and you see that Australia has come in a fourth with a score of a 74.2 and New Zealand has come in 10th. Now, what about the countries above us? The Netherlands has come in at number one Denmark at number two, both with scores above 80 and A grade. There is not a B plus system. No country has scored between 75 and 80. So who has knocked Australia off the bronze medal podium from last year? The answer, the answer is Israel. So Israel has come in third, Australia is fourth, uh, New Zealand is 10th. So that leads us to a natural question. How do these three systems compare? Why has Israel done well? We've known in the past, Netherlands and Denmark have done well. What about Israel? So we're going to have a little bit of a deep dive into the three systems. The basic pension, in Australia, we know it's means-tested age pension subject to an income or assets test. If you get the full pension, 27, 28% of the average wage. In Israel, a universal pension paid to everybody, 25% of the average wage. And New Zealand, let's call it 40% of the average wage. But what money do we have to set aside for the future? As we know in Australia, the SG is currently 9.5%. The debate, the legislation is that it goes to 12 the debate and the current question is, will that happen? In Israel, the contribution rate that must be paid is 12.5% into a funded system, 6% by employees, 6.5% by employers. New Zealand into KiwiSaver is 5%. So you add that together, the minimum pension or what happens with the age pension and what happens with the funded system, what's the net replacement rate for a full-time worker calculated by the OECD who's on average income. Australia, a bit under 40%. New Zealand, a bit over 40%. Israel, 53%. So I think you can see why Israel has knocked off Australia. It's got a universal pension paid to everybody and it's putting more money into the system than Australia will even if when we get to 12%. The other interesting difference is income requirements or what do people do once they get the benefit? What are the rules? What is the encouragement? In New Zealand, you do what you like as you do in Australia, although Australia does provide tax exemption for the in investment income for something like an account-based pension or annuity. Israel requires you to take 100% annuity now, I'm not a supporter of 100% annuity. I think that's a bit extreme, but clearly in retirement, we need to focus on income and not just lump sums. Uh, the balance of that will depend on the level of the basic pension. Uh, but speaking from an Australian perspective, I think it's fair to say we need a stronger income focus than we have at the moment. And finally, in terms of comparison, what do we put aside for the future? What's the level of pension assets? Australia, almost 150% of GDP. Israel, 
a bit under 60%, but their system has only been growing a bit more than 15 years. So we expect that number to increase and New Zealand about 40%. So it just gives you a very quick snapshot of why Israel has knocked off Australia in third place. Let's now have a look at the impact of COVID. As I said before, lower real economic growth has meant sustainability score has come down a bit on average about 1.2. Of course, the economy, most economies are likely to bounce back next year. Um, we take into account not just this year using IMF data, the last couple of years and their projection for the next uh, three years. So, but clearly an impact on growth. That then leads us to what other impacts there will be uh, because of COVID-19. The first one I think is we are going to have less money in the system to pay out pensions and benefits. There will be lower contributions, whether that's due to unemployment <clears throat> or reduced salaries, uh, less assets, less money going in. We're likely to see lower investment returns, particularly in the fixed interest area. And for some retirees, that's a very important area of investment. And of course, in Australia and in some other economies, we've seen money taken out of the system through the early release. So generally speaking, less assets, and that will lead to reduced pension income without further contributions. We've also seen increased government debt around the world. Doesn't cost a lot at the moment, but over time that um, may well reduce pension benefits paid by government. Reduced migration for countries such as Australia and New Zealand um, is increasing our old age dependency ratio. And if the uh, suggestions are right, that we also have lower fertility, uh, unless babies being born, uh, that will also affect the old age dependency ratio as we go forward. If there's an upside to this, it's that household savings rates are very high at the moment. Um, that, of course, is part of the overall system. Will they stay high or will some of that be spent? Only time will tell. But I think across the board around the world, COVID-19 is having a negative impact on pension systems and the uh, opportunity, if you like, and the outcome that pension systems will provide people in their retirement. So let's uh, just finish my presentation. Um, and uh, let me say that, uh, as many of you know, there's a Q&A button in uh, Zoom. So we're very happy to take your questions and the panel would look forward to them um, as we move to the panel. But a few things that we think are needed to improve the global pension systems around the world. We must increase coverage. In Australia, you say, well, hang on, isn't everyone covered? No. In New Zealand, you can opt out. But are we covering the self-employed? Are we covering contract workers, the gig workers? And even in Australia, those earning less than $450 a month. So around the world, we need to think about how we cover more people. We need to think about, over time, increasing the state pension age not a popular political move, but it needs to be done as life expectancies will continue to rise. We need to encourage people working a bit longer. New Zealand does that very well. And um, I think they're the second highest in the index on that measure. Reducing leakage in the system. We've obviously in Australia had a bit of leakage with the early release, extraordinary circumstances. Did we overdo it? We can have a debate about that, but we need to make sure that we preserve benefits for the future. We need to encourage high levels of saving around the world so people have got money when they retire and they're not relying on government. Well, again, globally, we need to improve governance, transparency, communication with members using modern technology. And the final point I make is the pension gender gap. Um, we all know that on average men have more money in the pension system than women for reasons that go beyond the super system. But we need to think about how we can rectify that. 
And I would also suggest that the gender gap has been accentuated by the impact of COVID because many of the industries that have been hardest hit have in fact a high proportion of female workers. So there are a few reform issues for the world. I'll now hand back to uh, Deb Ralston to chair the panel discussion. Thanks, David. And uh, some terrific uh, food for thought. I can see questions are starting to come in. Uh, thank you for that. Um, my, uh, um, have we introduced the panel yet? Yes, we have. We have. Thank you. <laughs> so all we do is go to the questions. So uh, first question, Maria. And um, this year, as David was saying, there's a new question in the index as to whether trustees are required to consider ESG issues. And it seems that only a minority of countries have responded in the affirmative. We know that uh, ESG is a really important part of the CFA agenda. How well do you think Australia is doing with respect to ESG? Well, thanks, Deb. Um, and ESG is a priority for CFA and we're looking um, at delivering credentials in that space. So it's absolutely top of mind. Uh, but Australia really is a leader in the ESG space. We, uh, we were early adopters of the UN PRI. Our very own Fiona Reynolds, in fact, leads that organisation um, now. Uh, we were, were quick to, um, to form uh, groups and businesses, you know, the Investors Group on Climate Change, uh, Regnan, Monash Sustainability Centre, AXI. These are all groups that are active in the ESG space and that's been very much um, embraced. Um, by Australia. Um, it hasn't so much been driven by regulation, which is why we don't get a great score um, in terms of the composition of the index. But in my experience, both as an asset manager and as an asset owner, ESG is absolutely um, top of mind. Um, it's been driven by, I would say, by trustees, by executives, um, by investment professionals, um, as well as by members. If you think of Bronwyn King and Tobacco Free Portfolios, she was a member um, and, and, uh, and has established a really powerful um, organisation in that space. So I would say that Australia is a leader um, in ESG. It doesn't actually reflect um, in our score um, at this point in time. I guess um, I, would, I should call out um, APRA has been pretty focused on climate change and requiring um, directors to focus on climate change. But beyond that, um, the, there's, there's no sort of formal um, acknowledgement of the role of, of ESG. And we know that if we are um, indeed in a, a low return environment, that investment stewardship um, is going to be more important than ever. Okay. So you don't think it will have a negative impact on people's focus on ESG, the hunt for higher return? No, I, I don't think so. And I think that we've seen the evidence, in fact, you know, ESG is very much at the forefront of people's minds. Yeah. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, AMP, we've seen Rio Tinto, both, uh, you know, examples just in the last couple of months where um, collective action by, um, by asset owners and, and, and shareholders more generally um, has led to real and significant um, action in terms of um, corporate behaviour. So I think it's here and it's here to stay. Terrific, thank you. I'll turn to Deep. Um, Deep, you've had a, a long history in investment and investment research. David mentioned um, the challenges the, and the broader implications of COVID-19 and what it means for investment teams and the superannuation system. What do you see as the major impact uh, of COVID on investment returns and what do you think we could do to mitigate those negative impacts? Uh, <clears throat> very good question, Deb. I'm, I'm not sure I have answers to what we are all debating these days. Um, so uh, let, me, let me stay away from the short term, you know, US elections and so on. I think, you know, we will have a new administration. We have learned to live with the current administration. I think we will all collectively learn to live with COVID as well. Um, you know, hopefully there's a medical solution and economies get back to normal sooner rather than later. But as a result of COVID, there are certain things that are going to be with us for quite some time. 
and I think these are issues that the investment community uh, are grappling with and will need to grapple with. And I'll, I'll go through a few of these quickly. Uh, one is geopolitically, the relationship between US and China, it doesn't look like even under the new administration, it will improve considerably. Um, you know, there were concerns about intellectual property rights and, and trade and so forth before the pandemic. Um, which was primarily being driven by the Republicans. Now there seems to be bipartisan agreement that you know, China is somehow responsible for COVID in the US. And uh, this, this will play on for, for many years. We may end up with two internet systems. So this is not going to be good for global growth, for corporate earnings, global trade, uh, you know, things which our economy is, is highly leveraged to. Um, so that's one, one aspect. The second is this whole digital economy, fourth industrial revolution idea. Uh, it's been about 10, year, 10 years since Mark Andreessen, the venture capitalist, wrote in the Wall Street Journal that software will be eating the world. And this is why I'm changing how I invest my VC funds. And, you know, 10 years from now, COVID has pulled forward adoption to such an extent that winners and losers in the business world on a 10 year view uh, is now going to be determined by how fast and how quickly uh, you adopt uh, digitization, internet of things, robotics and so forth. And I must say that looking back on my skill set and my career in the investment community and my friends and you know, others we were trained a certain way to evaluate investments. You know, we were not trained like an analyst is trained in a venture capital company. So today, even if you look at a industrial company, you have to start thinking about where are the opportunities for enhancing productivity through adoption of digital. So I think this does represent a major challenge. Um, in terms of how investors view the analytical issue. Uh, and this will play on for some period of time as you know things have just completely changed. I mean, IPO roadshows are being done online. Uh, m and due diligence is being done using drones and these are not, not going away. The third important thing for us as investors that's gonna be with us for quite some period of time is what I would you know, call bond market manipulation by central banks. You know, quantitative easing is a nice, nice way of saying that we are going to control all, all points of the yield curve. And you know, David mentioned that you know, interest rates are low, interest rates are going to remain low for, for a long period of time. The bond vigilantes um, have all died. So, you know, during the Clinton administration, James Carville said, I want to be reincarnated as the bond market. I don't think he would say that anymore. So the cavalry is out. We will have lower for longer um, because there's no way, you know, trillions of dollars of debt around the world are going to be managed by the government if long-term interest rates become equal to nominal GNP growth rate, which is what we were taught in economics textbooks. And that means the discount rates used for long duration growth stocks will you know, remain low and things that you think are expensive today will get even more expensive. And if you're not on the right side of trade and just hang on to you know, old economy companies, I don't know what the rewards are going to be. Um, I think we have to live and adapt to a low return world and how low is it? You know, I took a tour of various um, you know, websites from you know, respected asset managers who have long-term expected returns, real rates of return. That's what matters for investors. And by and large, there's consensus that today, a 50-50 global well-diversified stock bond portfolio has an expected long-term return of about 0% real. And meanwhile, the new reforms being introduced by the federal government in the last budget packet package has this huge push towards passive. And 
I'm not sure that if you are a passive investor in a 50-50 global stock bond portfolio, you will achieve a CPI plus 3% return objective. So it's a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. And that, you know, if, if the legislation is passed in this country, we will have to live with that. And it has all sorts of implications for how you structure uh, portfolios. Um, and I think, you know, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, there are some other things that are going to be important going forward. Uh, investment processes will need to be more agile than they have been in the past. Uh, that's a given, given, you know, um, uh, the spread of possible outcomes. Uh, I think one would probably need to create structures within investment organizations that take a more holistic view of risk management. At the moment, risk management is sort of buried in, you know, usually under portfolio construction under a CIO, but many multi-manager um, alpha factories, which have been successful over the last 20 or 30 years and some sovereign wealth funds offshore that I've seen have the risk function sitting under the CEO, not the CEO, so that there is a more holistic overview of, um, you know, managing extreme but plausible risks. And you know, the pandemic is is one. Um, I will have and, to ask you to wrap up, Dave. Yes. Yeah. Um, and at the policy level, Deb, to your question about, you know, the adverse impact is what? At the end of the day, we may have low retirement savings going forward. Uh, there is not a whole lot that can be done, but uh, perhaps um, one might want to consider a tax holiday for a few years uh, to help people build up their savings in this low return world. Um, you know, it could be a five, 10 year tax holiday in super, or it could be graduated. So the tax kicks in after a certain level of return has been achieved. Uh, and very quickly, Finally, a note of optimism, you know, we've seen war destroy economic infrastructure in Germany and Japan uh, with equity markets declining 90 to 95%. But on a long enough time horizon, even there investing in growth assets has yielded three to 4% real rates of return. So not all is lost, it's muddy waters. We just have to learn how to step around the puddles. Thanks, Thank goodness for an optimistic bit at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, man, um, I'm going to turn to Debbie Blakey now. Um, Debbie, HESA has a lot of female members, and I know you spend a lot of time thinking about gender issues. There's a new, another new question in the index this year as to whether a country provides additional contribution or benefits for those who've been out of the workforce undertaking caring responsibilities. And again, uh, the majority of countries have, have responded no to this question. So why do you think it is important to have this question in the index? And how well do you think we are dealing with these gender issues? Thank you, Deb. And first of all, to acknowledge this um, terrific work. And I think it is always great to see how well both Australia and New Zealand do rate but also good to see the index evolving and the addition of new questions like this. And obviously this is a brilliant question to add. I think it's important that as countries, we consider the areas of vulnerability for our pension systems and what can be done to address those, those vulnerabilities. And clearly a really important area is this issue of time out of the workforce to care for young children and how this impacts retirement benefits and particularly women. And in Australia, this is such a big contributor to the gender gap in retirement and the fact that women do retire on average with approximately 40% less than men. I, we often reflect at HESTA on the, um, the wonder of compound interest and the enormous benefit of having steady contributions at a reasonable level throughout one's working life. And in particular, those early years that accumulate returns for 20, 30, 40 years. And that's the exact time that, that people, and yes, generally women, have time out of paid work to care for young children. So like all things in life, I think if we, if we measure and if we assess and if we bring attention, it actually does help us to deal with issues. So we're absolutely thrilled to see the addition of this question. 
And obviously the fact that both Australia and New Zealand are in that group who said there are no additional contributions or benefits for women when they take time out of the workforce or people, men as well do sometimes, I think that's very disappointing. And there are a number of things that we could do to address that. And there are some, there's some terrific and innovative approaches globally. Obviously extension of paid parental leave and building super guarantee into that would, would address these issues. Super guarantee or a pension contribution on unpaid parental leave. I know a lot of companies choose to do that. We do at HESTA. But obviously a system solution is incredibly important. And then a voucher system. There's some countries where um, they've considered a voucher system linked to the birth of children, linked to that time out of the workforce or paid workforce that generally affects women's retirement benefits. I think David mentioned the importance of this in the COVID world, in this post-COVID world, and, and really those early indications that women will be more severely impacted by COVID and globally more, more severely impacted in terms of loss of hours, in terms of loss of jobs. And in fact, the progress we've made on gender equality and reduction in that gender pay gap and the gender gap in retirement could actually go into reverse. So this is a, an absolutely critical time for us to, to think about this issue and how we address it. And then on top of that, of course, in Australia, we've got the impact of the early release payments. And it's this exact group in Hester's experience, it's this exact group of women who have withdrawn early on their super as part of those early release mechanisms. So we clearly have a big issue and um, we're just so grateful that we're talking about it and that we're putting a spotlight on it because there is policy work to be done to address this at a system level. Mm. Thank you, Debbie. We could go on a long time on that, but time is precluding us. Thank you very much. And Martin, uh, Martin, uh, who's head of uh, Mercer New Zealand, um, you have a very different retirement system to Australia's, and we've seen, as David has stepped through, a, a really good comparison. How do you see the strengths of the New Zealand system? And over to you. Oh, look, hey, um, kia ora, and thanks, David, and thanks, Maria, and the CFA Institute. You know, doing the, this sort of work does help us figure out, you know, that there's no one size fits all, and um, it, the, the, the systems actually best reflect the societies that actually they, they originate from. And so some of the strengths of the New Zealand system are really the fact that it's um, not compulsory. New Zealanders don't really like being told what to do. However, there's the good bit of the nudge theory. You, you're in there once you start work and you've got to make the choice to opt out. So it can be quite sticky. Um, there's also limited opportunities to withdraw from it. And earlier on, we heard that, um, you know, the home ownership, very aspirational and a desire of many New Zealanders. And so that was one thing that was introduced into the, the KiwiSaver that you can actually withdraw. And so that does provide that secure, it does reflect the society's aspirations, does provide New Zealanders that opportunity, but there are some sensible criteria around that. So it's only for your first home, there's limits on how much you can actually spend on your home, depending on which location that it is in. Um, some of the other aspects, of course, we've got the universal superannuation system, so that's not affected by the amounts that you save in KiwiSaver. But there, look, there's quite a few things we can do to improve it, and I think they've been touched on earlier as well. New Zealand's population of self-employed people and small businesses, and a lot of those people seem to disappear off the, the KiwiSaver mm -hmm. radar, particularly if they're quite mobile around uh, my, the, the, their mobility in the workforce. And obviously the, the gender gender gap too. The, the, we do have a, a challenge in the New Zealand market um, addressing that as well. I noticed in your recent retirement income review that um, there was comment made around KiwiSaver at five percent being a bit of an anchor, and a, a recommendation to increase that uh, over time for people, which should be important, shouldn't it? Yeah. Look, there's there's two sides to that, and, um, and so. What we're trying to do is make sure it's all inclusive and you know new zealand is a relatively low, low wage economy there's a lot of people were employed pre-pandemic 
and hospitality and tourism, very low, and often, you know, they are, often are women, uh, agricultural workers. So, you know, the system did actually start off at around 4% and drop back to 2 to make it a lot easier to have a much more a broader um, coverage. So I think that's really good. Um, but then we do need to look at that whole uh, for, uh, replacement ratio. We do need to save more. That's the reality. So somehow we need to make sure the people that can save more do save more. And those that can't, we can actually, we, we've got the social um, social net there under the universal super. And, you know, people just have to acknowledge that there is some, some consequences there. Mm -hmm. No, That's just great. one the other strength yeah. there too. We talked about policy and um, ES, responsible investing. Certainly, the KiwiSaver is such a big part of our financial services sector in New Zealand. The default, um, the government appointed default providers, is that tender is coming up for tender at the moment, and there's a very strong flavour in the um, requirements for responsible investing and impact investing, and that's a way that there's a bit of carrot and stick going on there. So look, the market have been asking for this and there's been a big move, you know, led by the New Zealand Super Fund many years ago, but then the government's also now coming in and I think with a strong mandate and perhaps a wee bit more of a centre to centre left, that will continue to flow through into changes in KiwiSaver going forward. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's very nice to have such, and I think as David said, developing the index was such an issue because there are no two systems in the world that are exactly the same. So allowing for these differences and learning from differences is such an important thing. Absolutely. We have some, some questions coming through on the Q&A uh, now. And um, here's one directly for you, David. Where did Australia come in the integrity score? Yes, uh, thanks, Deb. Thanks for that question. Sorry, I must have just skipped that one. In terms of integrity, Australia came in sixth with a score of 85.5. Uh, New Zealand came in 10th, 82.9. So both very credible scores. One of the things Australia could do to improve integrity, I talked about communication, is to require benefit projections, income projections on their annual statements. A number of countries do that. And I think income projections are a much better way of focusing the mind than saying, I've got $50,000 in my account. Because what's $50,000 when you know, I'm about to retire? But if it's going to be equivalent to a $3,000 annual income in your retirement, oh, that's not much. I better do something about that. So mm. I think benefit projections is an area where Australia could improve its integrity score. Thank you. And Deb, some great new research on that. Yes, Marina. Deb, can I just um, add some comments to that? I, I think it's interesting that Australia ranks very well in integrity relative to the other systems. The area where we don't rank so well um, is in fact inadequacy. Um, you'd actually think from a lot of the, um, from the discourse um, that it was the other way around. There's been a lot of uh, emphasis and attention given to the integrity of our system, the governance and our trustee arrangements. Um, and I, I think the index actually will, by the numbers, um, you know, we, we rank well in terms of trust um, and integrity. Um, the key issue for Australia, and uh, I guess the way for us to, um, to focus on continual improvement is in fact around adequacy. Um, and the, um, I mean, it's not even an elephant in the room, let's just bring it out. Uh, the, the, um, whether the, the increase in the SG rate is in fact um, delayed, it's, it's currently legislated. Let's just hope that that proceeds um, as is currently legislated because that is one way that we can address head on um, the effectiveness of our system. Thanks. Mm, for sure. Um, I've got another question here, which is something we haven't touched on at all, but it's quite quite relevant from Graham Hand. Given the impact of COVID on super balances and future low returns, which we've talked about a bit, how robust is the standard 4% <coughs> withdrawal rate assumption? Who'd like to take that one? David, we might have to start with you because okay. you, you, you will have thought about this yet. Yeah, look, I think one of the problems uh, with the 4% withdrawal rate or whatever percent you want to put it in Australia is, I'm going to come back to the retirement income review, Deb, which you're not going to comment on because you can't, but 
the integration between the withdrawal of from your super and the means tested age pension because they work together and therefore in the Australian system there is not a single answer um, it depends on who you are <clears throat> how much you've got how much pension you get in the New Zealand system where you've got a universal pension you know what the base is and you then mm. build on that I think it's really hard in the Australian system for someone in the middle if you've only got a low balance you know what your pension's going to be if you've got a million dollars plus you're likely to get no pension but many people are in the middle as we know on a part pension and therefore i wouldn't even say the four percent is a standard rule for australia it depends on your circumstances yes uh, so it's a pretty pretty true and i do think that when we get into these discussions we do tend to focus just on one pillar and it really is the collection of pillars that provide for people's retirement income. Um, and I'm, if I can just add them, and I'm sure your report will look at it, the um, role of the home as well. And mm. where does that fit in? So we need a more holistic picture than just one. Yeah, number. absolutely. Which I think has always been the great strength of the index is that it does look across the three pillars. Um, is there any other burning issues? There are a number of questions here which say, how can we improve? And we've talked about adequacy and, and uh, Maria's particularly drawn the spotlight to that. Um, are there things that we've left out? Uh, we've talked a fair bit about DSG. Are there other ways in which we can really improve uh, people's outcomes and, and adequacy? And we have talked about the gender issues. Are we missing anything there? I mean, I think that we, um, oh, sorry, Debbie. No. Um, I, I feel that we can learn from the early release scheme. I feel that um, we need to do, as an industry, we need to do a better job at communicating the purpose of super. Now, I completely understand that some people suffer genuine hardship, but I'm not sure that that's universally true. And we do, I think the industry, um, owe, we owe it to our members to communicate that this money um, is is there for to generate retirement income? I think that's um, I think that's a really important thing. So communication. We know that people, if they were to engage more in their superannuation, um, be kind of more active participants, that they might make um, more appropriate um, choices um, around investment choice. That that would improve their retirement income. So you know, I think that there's significant onus on the industry to to. To, to, to lift its game. And I know, I know that's tough and I know every fund is focused on that, but you know, maybe Debbie, you might like to, to chat. Mm. I was just gonna add exactly that. I, I think it's really important we tell the positive story about the Australian superannuation system and the New Zealand system. And um, you think of the strong pillars of the Australian system. I, I do think universality, compulsion, preservation are such strong contributors to the system we've got. And hearing what Martin said about compulsion, I, I do understand that you know possibly people don't like the compulsion, but for us in Australia, it's been um, it has been a cornerstone. And the fact that we have contributions at a reasonable level, going to ten percent hopefully in July, and the fact we have preservation, and I, I do this was a different time in COVID. But I think we have to make sure that we protect what we've got. It's a phenomenal system. I've, I've been in Australia for 20 years and I can't tell you how amazing I think the system is. And there are so many countries around the world who would be so envious. And if we want to keep it and retain it, we have to make sure we're telling the story about it, the really good news story of the amazing decisions that have been made and what we have and what we should treasure. Mm. Thank Deb, you, Deb. Deb, I might just... And I, yeah. I think there are two things that we can do. One, we can simplify the system. It's complicated. And yeah. when, when I talk about simplifying, I talk about the whole system and not just super, um, because it is a really complicated system. And I think the incentives are not necessarily there. I think the other problem is I'm not sure we as an industry have told our story well. We, we hear all the argument about tax concessions and that well, sorry, you've got to look at, in the big picture, the government expenditure on retirement income. That includes the age pension, as well as taxation support. And we tend to get caught up in a debate around tax concessions go to the, the wealthy or whatever it might be. Well, the age pension goes to the poor. 
I'm, I'm not objecting to that at all, but let's have a look at a, a balanced debate. And in fact, it's the middle people, middle income earners, that don't get enough either way. And that's where I think the means test comes into play uh, and up tart the harsh assets test taper. Um, but again, we need to look at the big picture. And I think what the media and politicians and ourselves to some extent look at is we take a single issue rather than the big picture. Yeah. I think um, your original question to me, Deb, you know, the, the New Zealand system actually it is some, summarised in one word as simplicity. Absolutely. We have a very simple system here and they, they do try and do the big picture. When it gets a wee bit messy is when politicians do try and take a narrow slice or, or a narrow view. In fact, going into the COVID situation, we had the government and the regulator actively discouraging hardship withdrawals from KiwiSaver. They were pointing out in a very proactive way, there are wage subsidies, there's um, benefits, there's a whole lot of other places you can go to get you through a really difficult period. Leave your KiwiSaver alone. That's for the long term. So you know, that was great to see that sort of support and clarity of thinking uh, by politicians, the regulator and, and the industry. Yeah, and, and quite a contrast too. That's very yeah. interesting, Martin, too. I think there's one one more question. Um, there's a question from Aaron Minnie, and I guess we're gonna to have to go back to David again. It says, why is Australia's average retirement income so low? Does the OECD measure capture the benefit of super properly? Uh, well, that's a good question, Aaron. Um, the net replacement rate is low because what the OEC does is basically says Australia contributes, uh, we know the SG. Then they, but we're not providing a pension. It's a DC system, as we all know. So they, they have to convert that to an annuity or an income stream, if you like. And of course, um, annuity prices, well, they do allow for some real rate of return there and they allow for some capital backing um, of the annuity provider, but that gives you the income. And then what they find, as I've almost alluded to, is the average income earner, because they have this annuity income, doesn't get any age pension um, so in, in the first year of retirement. Now they do, to be fair, um, they look at the first year in retirement and you purchased an indexed annuity because when you're trying to compare systems around the world, an index pension is the, the easiest proxy. I'm not saying it's perfect, um, but Australia and some other countries with a means tested system where you tend to get more age pension in the latter years mm. as you run down your assets, uh, mm. come out at some disadvantage from the OECD calcs. They, well, they would, particularly against the universal pension too. Correct. We're going to have to finish the questions now, but we've just had a comment from Jane Wrightson, who's the uh, new retirement commissioner in New Zealand, to say that New Zealand is re releasing a purpose statement for their retirement system tomorrow. So look out for that. Thank you, Jane. Um, here's a, a, a slide. Please download the full um, Global Pension Index report by using that QR code. And thank you very much to everyone for their contributions to David and the panel and also the teams behind the scenes. It's been very good indeed. And thank you everyone for your attendance today.